Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear a debate with Dan Barker and Douglas Wilson. The topic of the debate? Resolved. Religion and government should be strictly separate, with Dan taking the affirmative and Doug the negative. If you enjoy this talk, make sure to go to canonpress.com to find Doug's book on logical fallacies called Adorable Fallacies. Good evening. Tonight, the proposition, as most of you know, uh, to be debated this evening is the following. Religion and government should be strictly separate. Now, arguing in the affirmative that religion and the government should indeed be completely separate is Mr. Dan Barker. Mr. Barker is co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and is a former minister and evangelist. In 1983, he became an atheist, or what he calls a free thinker. He's the author of two books which are published by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He's also a graduate of the Azusa Pacific University with a degree in religion. He's a professional pianist. His CDs and cassettes are also published by the foundation. Please welcome Mr. Dan Barker. Our other speaker, Mr. Douglas Wilson, will be arguing that religion and government should not be strictly separate. Mr. Wilson is a senior fellow of theology at New St. Andrews College here in Moscow. He received a BA in classical studies and a BA and an MA in philosophy all at the U of I. He's the author of numerous books and the editor of the magazine Credenda Agenda. He's been the pastor of Christ Church here in Moscow for 30 year, almost 30 years. Please welcome Mr. Douglas Wilson. Okay, here is the format that we're gonna follow for the debate. Each person is going to give a 20, not each person out there, each of these two gentlemen will give a 20 minute opening statement, Mr. Barker going first since he's arguing the affirmative position. After the opening statements, the speakers will have 10 minutes each for rebuttal. Let me make a brief comment before we begin to get us going. Remember, each speaker is arguing for a conclusion, right? Each man will present an argument composed of premises that hopefully logically lead to his conclusion. So here's the point. The speakers don't simply disagree over the conclusion to the other's argument. More importantly, they disagree at some more fundamental point. Now, this is important to keep in mind when you're listening to a debate, when you're reading an article uh, in a journal or any kind of, any kind of argument at all. Um, but it's not always easy to spot these more fundamental disagreements. And usually those are the ones that are more important, of course. So be on the lookout uh, for those fundamental disagreements. Now, uh, we'll, be we'll begin the debate with Mr. Barker's opening statement. Mr. Barker, you have 20 minutes when you're ready, I'll say. Well, thank you, Mitch, and thank you, Doug, and thank all of you for coming. As you know, I used to be a Christian minister. I stood in a lot of pulpits in my life, and I stood before a lot of believers. And I have to confess that tonight, as I stand up here in front of a room with a whole lot of believers in a pulpit, some of those old feelings start to wash over me again. And I can't help it. I stand here with this almost irresistible urge to take up a collection. <laughs> but maybe I can resist that temptation. Whatever you think about religion, and I'm sure there's many different opinions in this room, there's one fact that none of us in this room can deny. Religion is divisive. Religion builds walls between people and between groups of people. It creates insiders and outsiders. Religion creates the elect versus the damned, or the chosen 
versus the Gentiles or the saved versus the heretics or whatever you want to call it, the believers versus the infidels. And there are a number of infidels here tonight. I happen to meet some friends that, that came some long distances to be here and thank you for coming. Infidel is a very positive, good word that I wear with honor. Religion creates also some special classes of people, gurus or shamans or rabbis or imams or priests or pastors, people who think they have been set apart or chosen in some way, people who have the arrogance to assume that they can pastor over a flock of sheep who must submit and follow their orders. There are many sources of social conflict water, territory, resources, access to females or access to males or you name it. Of all of the sources of social conflict that exist in the world, religion has been the most problematic. Why is this? Hector Avalos in his excellent new book, Fighting Words, The Origins of Religious Violence, points out that with these other sources of conflict, at least in principle, there's some way to solve the problem. You can share the water or you can do something with resources. But religion creates unverifiable resources. Religion creates these things that actually don't exist. These resources like salvation or scripture or holy spaces or group privileging are things that no one can possibly verify because they don't exist. They are concepts. Doug Wilson's concept of a God in his mind is a concept. It's a powerful concept but it points to nothing in reality. So what happens when you're fighting over something that there's no rational way to resolve? History shows us that the only way to settle a religious conflict is with violence. Religion at its heart is intrinsically violent. Look at history. I know there's a lot of wonderful Muslims and Jews and Christians and Baha'is and Sikhs and Native American spiritualists. I know that. There's a lot of wonderful atheists in the world as well and agnostics. But at its heart, religion is violent. Religion tries to impose upon the world. If someone challenges your religious beliefs, what do you do? You kill them. Look at the Bible. Look at the Old Testament especially, but look at the Bible. That's how conflicts were resolved in the Bible. The Bible, the uninspired, errant word of God believers solves its problems by killing. Peace in the Bible is not peace like getting along. Peace in the Bible was the imperialistic concept of pacification. You shut down the enemies. You turn them into slaves or you kill them or, you, or whatever. Then you will have pacification in the world. Look at the Islamic war against Medina or the re regional conquest of the, of the Muslims. Look at the Christian crusades. What were they fighting about? Something unverifiable, a stupid waste of human life over something totally non-existent. And yet people went to their graves happy to be dying for this cause, for this myth, for this lie. There are many examples in history, and I think you could name as many as I can. Let me give one poignant example, and that's John Calvin. John Calvin very bravely dissented from the authority of his day. The authority of his day was the Roman Catholic Church. He had the intelligence to rise above the authority and think for himself and say, wait a minute. He challenged the authority of the church for many reasons and he, following Luther's lead, broke free and said, we are not gonna follow, we are gonna dissent, we are going to protest and they, they reformed, they were reformers, they were Protestants. He wrote his Institutes of the Christian Religion and then what did he do? He turned right around and became just as much a bully as the Roman Catholic Church was. What did John Calvin do? He set up a little mini theocracy of his own. Now that he had written his institutes, now there was no more room for dissent. Now he was able to dissent, but no one else could. No one could disagree with him. He executed people for the crime of simply dissenting from his opinions. He banished people from Geneva from this theocracy. He uh, instituted complete thought control. No theater, there was, there was these thought police in that city. Religion and government were united under Calvin and it was a horrible disaster to human freedom and to truth. One example is Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus, many of you know, like John Calvin, was also a dissenter from the Roman Catholic Church. Servetus deeply believed in God. He read the Bible 
And yet he came to a slightly different conclusion than John Calvin. And Servetus was, was enjoying his newfound freedom to read the Bible for himself, but he was convinced with careful rational thought that the doctrine of the Trinity was wrong. He, like Isaac Newton, another believer, and many others were convinced that through careful, honest, open study of the scripture with an open heart, the doctrine of the Trinity could not be substantiated. He was arrested and put in, a, in jail by the Roman Catholic Church, but he escaped. And what did he do? He, he thought he could go up to John Calvin and, and reason with him. He thought, since we are dissenters, let's talk this out. And, and Servetus was convinced. He was a brilliant doctor, by the way. Servetus was the first guy to uh, explain the circulation of the blood through the human body. He thought, well, Calvin's a, a bright guy. Let's talk this out, and I can explain to him what's wrong with Calvin's theology. What did Calvin do? Calvin had Michael Servetus burned at the stake. He had committed no crime in Geneva. He had broken no law in that city. He had broken no biblical law. His only crime was that he had the audacity to challenge the authority of the theocrat, of the John Calvin himself. Calvin did not separate religion and government. He united them, and that union was deadly. Not only did he have him burn at the stake, he tied Servetus' book to his body, and he ordered that all of Servetus' books should be destroyed. And when Servetus was being burned at the stake for his heresy, for his audacity to dare to challenge the uh, inerrant word of Calvin, he was burned with his book on his side. John Calvin was a monster. And when monsters gain political and governmental authority, the people suffer. Government becomes a joke. No, it's worse than that. Government becomes the enemy of the people. The New Testament even says that you shall know them by their fruits. Look at the fruits of John Calvin. Anyone who holds John Calvin in any high esteem is morally bankrupt. Anyone who thinks John Calvin was a good man is morally bereft. And the same is true of the Bible. Anyone who holds the Bible in high esteem is also morally bankrupt. It is not inspired, it is contradictory, it is an insult to human dignity. There is no democracy in the Bible. There's no intrinsic fairness. There's no acknowledgement that human beings have any worth. It's just a book written by a bunch of believers who thought we should become slaves to a dictator. The Puritans came to America and they brought that monster, John Calvin, with them. There's the joke about the Puritans. They loved religious freedom so much that they kept it all to themselves. They, uh, they wanted to break free to practice their religion, but once they had their freedom, then they did not give it to anyone else. There's a danger in uniting religion and government. You know what happened with the Puritans. There were banishments, there were hangings for the crime of witchcraft. That's not a crime. There's one book, verse in the Bible, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, and that verse alone completely discredits the Bible. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of men and women were, were tortured and killed because they were thought to be witches. And what is the crime? What did they do? They brought this, this mental religious sickness with them to this continent. The United States founders, more than a century later, wanted no part of the religious divisiveness of the colonists. The petty quarrels, the banishments because of not believing in the Trinity, and the killings and the excommunications and the horrible tortures that Bible-believing Christians were inflicting on others. So they wrote a godless document, and they said, we want no part of this. We want no part of this uh, religion and government being together. Religion should be a private matter. The United States of America is a proudly rebellious nation. We fought a revolutionary war. Like John Calvin and Martin Luther, we thought, wait a minute, we don't have to submit to some authority. We don't have to have a sovereign up there telling us what to do, a king, a master, a lord. We kicked the king, the sovereign, the master, the lord off of these shores when we founded this country. We wrote the first constitution that separated state and church. It is a totally godless document. No mention of God anywhere uh, except in that little uh, dating convention, which is not actually in the uh, constitution. And we, for the first time, turned the government upside down. Whereas before, like with John Calvin and other religious governments, the sovereign was God that we all had to submit to. We turned it completely upside down and started with we the people. There is no sovereign over we the people. We the people are running this country. There's no king. There is no master. They wrote a First Amendment to separate state and church. They wrote a treaty with Tripoli that very explicitly said the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. 
Thomas Jefferson in 1802 on, on January the 1st. He went to work on New Year's Day. From his office, uh, wrote an official letter saying, I contemplate with solemn reverence that act of the whole American people uh, who, de who declared that their legislature shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Um, Ulysses S. Grant came along and said, leave religion to the family altar. Religion is a private matter. Keep the state and church forever separate. In 1890, there was a decision in my state, in Wisconsin. They used to read the Bible in Wisconsin, but it was stopped because a family complained that they shouldn't be reading the Bible. And it went all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and in 1890, the Weiss decision declared Bible reading in the public schools to be unconstitutional. Can you guess who brought that lawsuit? Was it an atheist family? D does anybody know? Was it a Jewish family maybe? Well, I'll tell you who it was. It was a Roman Catholic family who brought that lawsuit because they were reading the King James Bible in the public schools. And the Roman Catholic said, well, you can't do that. We read the, the Douay or the Reims Bible. You can't just read the Protestant Bible. That's not fair. So the Roman Catholics sued and won, and because of the Roman Catholics suing and winning, we no longer, thankfully, no longer have Bible reading in the public schools, formal Bible reading. The world is a much better place because of that. The Bible it corrupts morality. The Bible reading in the schools uh, leans away from true moral thinking. And in that decision in 1890, uh, the, the court said this, there is no such source and cause of strife, quarrel, fights, malignant opposition, persecution, and war, and all evil in the state as religion. Let it once enter our civil affairs, our government would soon be destroyed. Now, I'm arguing that state and church should be completely separate, but that does not mean that believers don't have a voice in their government. It's we the people. All of you Christians and Muslims and Jews and Baha'is and Sikhs and Unitarians, you all have a voice in the government, just like we atheists do too. It doesn't mean when we keep state and church separate that we don't have free speech. We can all speak our mind as individuals. It also does not mean that no Christian can hold public office or no Jew could hold public office. To keep state and church separate means that everyone is welcome to hold public office. Our Constitution very explicitly says there shall be no religious test for public office. What it means to keep state and church separate is it means that government as government, not individuals as individuals, not private individual speech, but government as government, governmental official speech, should be neutral on religious grounds. The government should neither advance religion or hinder religion. The government should allow us who believe or disbelieve, to argue among ourselves, to argue with John Calvin, and tell him what a nutcase he was for having those views, what an evil monster he was. Well, we should have the, the freedom to even insult each other, I suppose. It may, may not be very civil, but the government will not step in. We should have complete freedom to insult someone else's God if we think that's important. If I want to tell the God of the Bible that he should go to hell, I should be free to do that. In fact, if that God did exist, and if he did create a hell, that's exactly what I would tell him. I would tell him he is an immoral monster. He solves his problems with violence. Hell is the ultimate violence. Who could have any respect for a God who solves his problems with pain and violence? That is not morality. That is not goodness. A God like that can call himself good as much as he wants. But I judge him to be an, an evil and a bad influence if he did exist. Of course, he doesn't exist, but, you know. But in America, I'm free to say that, aren't I? But under John Calvin, I would be burned at the stake for saying that. I would be, I, for blaspheming the name of God, which is a direct uh, crime in the Bible. Blasphemy is a crime in the Old Testament. I should be put to death. I shouldn't just be censured. I should be physically executed for saying what I just said. And that's the kind of religion that Doug believes in. He believes in the religion of the Old Testament itself. He thinks people like me he thinks homosexual, practicing homosexuals ought to be killed. If Doug had political and governmental power, 
this country would fall to pieces. We would not have peace, we would have strife, we would have war, we would have divisiveness. Doug is free to have his views, as crazy as I think they are, I respect his freedom to have them. Just like I'm, I'm sure he, but he respects my freedom to have views that he considers to be crazy and erroneous, and I know he does. We debate, debated before, and you can see how we affected each other, you know. We really changed each other's minds. It means that when a, a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or an atheist hold public office, they must execute their secular office because government deals with real problems in the real world. Government deals with lessening violence. Religion wants to increase violence. Government wants to lessen violence. Um, even Jesus um, talked in very many strong, violent words. Uh, he talked about beating your slaves, for example. But there are some slaves you ought not to beat as hard as other slaves. You should be compassionate and beat them a little less because they didn't know better. So the, the freedom for me to, to discredit the Bible does not mean that if I were elected to public office, I could get up in my office. Suppose I were a mayor of a city. I would have no right to put a banner above City Hall that says there's no God. That would be wrong. I'd be violating the Constitution to use my position, no matter what my views are, pro or against religion. Separating state and church means that when a public official is working for the government and as the government, they are neutral. In a country where church and state are separate. You and I, Doug and I, are free to disagree about religious matters. But we are not free to ask our government to settle the argument. Now, uh, I, have, I probably have a few seconds to talk about that fundamental um, difference of opinion that you were mentioning there, Mitch. And I will tell you exactly right here what that fundamental difference of opinion is between me and Doug, and it's the Bible. I consider the Bible to be unreliable. I consider the Bible to be untrue. I consider the Bible to have many lies and mistakes, uh, scientific inaccuracies. I consider it to be terribly uninspiring. I consider the Bible to be a step back for humanity. And I gather that Doug does consider the Bible to be our bedrock of truth. And as you listen to his comments tonight, do like Mitch, uh, Mitch uh, cautioned you to do, and notice how much of his reasoning is based on a book written by ancient, primitive God-believers who didn't know as much about the world as you and I know about, and who were not any more moral than you and I are. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to a great rest of this debate. I'd like to thank uh, Dan for coming. Uh, it was enjoyable meeting him a few years ago in uh, Delaware where we debated before on the question of whether uh, the triune God of uh, Scripture lives. Uh, this evening we're debating a more applied topic. We are talking about uh, uh, religion and government, whether they should be kept separate or not. I want to begin by uh, noting or stating emphatically what I'm not prepared to deny. I am not opposed to the separation of church and state. Let me say that again. I am not opposed to the separation of the institutional church, the government of the church, ministers, the apparatus of government in the church, the institution of the church, and the institution of civil government. I believe that that is a prudent and a wise way to conduct our affairs. I affirm and believe in the separation of church and state. One of the early Ameri uh, American colonies, I believe it was North Carolina, uh, at, the, at, the time of the, uh, at the time of the revolution, nine of the 13 colonies had established Christian religions as the established religion or the faith of their state. And I think it was in North Carolina where they, they uh, had this religious establishment, but they also required that a minister, uh, an ordained minister, could not serve as a political representative. In other words, that, that is a separation of the civil authority and church authority. That is a separation of civil government and church government, which I enthusiastically support. 
I am, however, denying that we can separate God and state. I'm denying that we can separate morality and state. And I'm denying that we can separate fundamental religious values and state. I'm not arguing that it's not a good idea to separate these things. I'm arguing that it's impossible to separate these things. It can't be done. So I want to say that ultimate questions about God and state cannot be detached from one another. Ultimate questions about what constitutes a moral course of action and how do we know, how can we identify that, how can we tell, uh, that cannot be separated from questions of statecraft. And fundamental, ultimate religious commitments cannot be separated from decisions that are made by governors and presidents and congresses and, and parliaments and so on. With regard to the separation of church and state, the comments we just heard notwithstanding, not only, uh, not only are we contemporary Calvinists, I'll, I'll own it right at the beginning, I, to identify myself as morally bankrupt, I, I am, I am a uh, black coffee Calvinist. I'm a crawl over broken glass Calvinist. I am a, uh, uh, I wake up in the morning thinking, yay, Calvinism. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a contemporary Calvinist. But I want to argue that not only do we contemporary, uh, not only are we contemporary Calvinists, um, good with this idea of the separation of church and state, I want to go so far as to argue that we invented it. Right? We invented the idea of sphere sovereignty. Uh, Calvin's, one of Calvin's great battles in Geneva was precisely over this question, struggling to detach the authority of the church from the authority of the state. There are, um, there are basically three options that you can you can go with when you have uh, a powerful uh, presence in the church. One of them was the option taken by uh, Rome in the medieval era, and Rome, uh, Rome has not in principle repudiated this doctrine, as they don't have it in practice now, but uh, uh, papal supremacy is not claimed in the Roman Catholic system for just other denominations and churches. Uh, the supreme pontiff um, claims to be the vicar of Christ on earth and claims to have authority over all governments, not just ecclesiastical governments. So in the medieval system, the, uh, the uh, vicar of Christ at Rome, the pontiff was the supreme earthly governor. And all, um, uh, all civil authorities had to reckon with him and obey him in principle. And this, of course, caused some heartburn and some difficulties, particularly um, in the 1300s as there was a rising sense of nationalism. Uh, Wycliffe was involved in that and there were another, a number of princes in Europe who were a little uh, unhappy with this setup, but that was the setup. Rome was the, the, the church, the government of the church was the supreme government over all other governments. After the Reformation, one of the things that happened in a number of countries was that this was just flipped where you had what uh, came to be called Erastianism. Erastianism is where you have the civil government claims ultimate jurisdiction over all governments, including church governments. Uh, you had that state of affairs with, uh, during the time of the Westminster Assembly, where Parliament, uh, during the uh, interregnum between the two Charleses, par Parliament claimed to have authority over uh, the church. This view is called Erastianism. And, uh, and, and it was resisted by Calvin. Calvin didn't want the church to dictate all terms to the civil authority. Calvin was arguing for a separation of church government and, uh, uh, church government and state government. But he was not arguing for an ultimate and complete detachment of the two, but he was saying the government of the church and the government of the civil authority ought to be separate. Uh, I'd recommend a good book called The Emergence of Liberty in the Modern World by Douglas Kelly that outlines the history of this idea. So not only are we okay with the separation of church and state, the institutional church and the institutional state, I want to say that this is one of Calvinism's contributions to our uh, current system of separating church and state. Now, but let's return to the, the point of disagreement, which is the separation of God and state, the separation of morality and state, moral questions and the state. And, uh, 
and the separation of religious concerns and the state. If someone says, I believe in separating church and state, we're so used to that, it rolls off the tongue and everybody says, oh, that sounds great, that sounds inspiring, that sounds like liberty will break out everywhere. If the, if the president uh, gave an address to the nation and he said, I want to reassure all Americans that I firmly believe in the separation of church and state, we'd say, yeah, go, go, George, even, even if you're not a normally go, George kind of person. But suppose he got on the television and said, my fellow Americans, I want to reassure you that I believe in the absolute detachment and separation of morality and state. I want you to know that when I make decisions, they have nothing whatever to do with morality. Now you might think, I thought so, you know. Uh, <laughs> I've, sus I've suspected this for some time, but, but the suppose he said it out loud. I don't want my decisions to be driven by any moral considerations, whatever. We'd all, we, all of us would go jeepers. You know, you can't say that. You can't separate morality and state. But then the question is, okay, if you can't separate morality and state, what's your morality based on? Where does it come from? All right? Personal whims? If, it's, if morality is based on your personal whims, then uh, suppose the president said, well, I want my fellow Americans, I want you to know that I'm going to govern this nation according to my personal whims. Because that is, that's morality. That's, the, and that's as far as we can go. I think we would all have a problem with it. It is it, uh, extraordinarily problematic to, to argue that we need to separate morality and state, or ultimate religious questions from state. So this is why we have to identify what kind of debate this is? What kind of debate is this? This is not a debate over whether to go left or right. We are not gathered here to debate res the, the, the topic resolved. Um, we, should, we should paint City Hall blue, all right? With one side saying, yes, we should paint it blue, and the other side saying we should paint it some other color, because it's obvious when you consider um, when you consider this, when you consider that question, it's obvious that we can paint it blue or not. We can paint it blue or another color. We can paint it or not paint it at all. We have, we have any number of options open to us. Now that's one kind of deba debate. Should we go this way or that way? Should we march, march around the circle? Should we stand still? We have a choice of doing any one of these things. Another kind of debate would be this, resolved. We should obey gravity. Okay, resolve, we should obey gravity. I saw a great t-shirt once. Gravity, it's not just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> now, if you, if you said we should obey gravity and you got someone to, uh, I would want the affirmative. Um, <laughs> but if you got someone to obey, the, uh, to, to take up the negative, they would have to say, um, we would have to point out that maybe we need to think for a moment about what kind of debate we're in because a debate over whether to obey gravity in a situation where gravity is inescapable means that, uh, that we are, uh, the debate is only going to proceed if we give way to some sort of basic confusion. I want to argue that these, this question before us is an inescapable question. It's an inescapable concept. What do, we, what do I mean by an inescapable concept? It's summed up by a four-word phrase, not whether but which. Not whether, but which. It's not whether we will impose our morality when we adopt a legal system. It's not whether we will impose a morality when we adopt a legal system. It's which morality we will impose. A legal system, by definition, imposes on people. Right? If no one needed to be imposed upon, as James Madison said, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. Right? If everybody just naturally stayed away from everybody else's bicycle and would never think of stealing it, if no one would ever think of robbing or stealing or cheating or raping or murdering, if this would just ne spontaneously never occur to anyone, we wouldn't need laws against it. We, ha we have laws against these things because some people want to do them. And when we say, you may not, and if you do, we will execute you or we will put you in the penitentiary for a long time or we will do any number of things, Whatever it is we're doing, we can't say that we, we can't pretend that we're not imposing. We're imposing on this individual. The British, uh, when they were uh, in India, imposed on a 
peculiar religious sect whose religion consisted of robbing, um, robbing travelers and killing them. And this sect, this religious sect, were known as the thuggies, from which we get our term thug. A thug is someone who originally had a religious conviction that that man's money should belong to me. And I will take it from him, and I am willing to impose my thuggy religion on him, and the British were willing to impose their Western imperialist religion on the thuggies. The point is, somebody is imposing on somebody. It's not whether we will impose morality in a legal system. It's not whether we will impose morality. The question, the only question, is which morality we will impose. If you say, I will impose no morality whatever, then you're not an advocate of a legal system. You are advertising to be robbed. Because you're going to impose on no one, you, you're going to impose on no one else. But if we order our society in a particular way, we will impose on people who cheat on their taxes. We will impose on people who drive on the left side of the road because that's how they did it in England, where they come from. We will impose on, uh, we will impose on people who believe that they should have a right to everyone else's property. It's not whether we will impose morality. All law, by definition, is an imposition of morality. And there's always going to be a bright sophomore in the back of the class who's going to raise his hand and say, which morality is this that we're imposing? And why should we have the right to kill and incarcerate people because of it? What, what morality, what's the name of this system? And if someone says, well, this is the greatest good for the greatest number. So you say, all right, so we're imposing Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism. Is that right? Everyone who's not a Benthamite utilitarian goes to the slammer. If you don't agree with utilitarianism and you fail to go along with the greatest good for the greatest number, or Immanuel um, Kant's categorical, categorical imperative, or sort of a, um, uh, an empty, a, a filleted version of the, of the golden rule, you know, just be nice, everybody. Uh, what you're doing is you're ignoring the fact that moral, uh, legal systems, by definition, impose on people, and you're imposing a morality, and somebody's going to see that that's what, you're uh, that's what you're doing. It's not whether we will have a God in our system. It's which God we will have. It's not whether we will serve a God. It's which God we will serve. And uh, Dan identified for us his God. Right? He doesn't believe in a God in the traditional sense of a divine being who created the world, but he does have a God over his legal system. The God over his legal system is named Demos, the people. We the people, right? We the people determine left, right, what we do. That's the, the, when, you, when you get to the ultimate source of authority in any system, you have identified the God of that system. And I'm using the word God with a, a lowercase g. The lowercase g, God of the system, is the point past which there's no appeal. You can't appeal past this point. So. It's not whether, but which. In our current situation, in our current situation, in our current secular arrangement, we Christians are being told that we may believe anything we like behind our eyes and between our ears. But as citizens in the public square, we are being told that we may not proceed on the assumption that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the public square, we are being required, our, someone else's morality is being imposed upon us, and we will be shouted down, fined, attacked, vilified, whatever, if we say, you know, I'm, I'm supporting this legislation because I believe that God said to Moses on Mount Sinai, thou shalt not kill. That's why I'm doing this. I believe that. I believe it as a Christian, and I happen to be a state legislator, and I'm introducing this legislation because God said to Moses, and I believe that. Will the public secular morality be imposed on such a person? You bet, right? Because all, no, legal, no legal system, no society can function without protecting its gods. No legal system can function without protecting its uh, source of morality. And because the United States is currently a secularist democracy or is an ex-Christian republic, trying hard to become a secularist democracy and largely succeeding, 
Because we Christians are in that position, we're being told that we may believe in the Christian faith, in the privacy of our own homes, and perhaps not there very long, but in the privacy of our own hearts and minds, certainly, and, and we may entertain whatever thoughts about God in the afterlife and angels and, and archangels and cherubim and seraphim and Farley's ghost that we want, right? We may think whatever we want, but when we step into the public square, we are being commanded that we must function as though we were agnostics, all right? We must function as though we are secularists, but we are not secularists. We are Christians. Now, let me uh, say something important here. I don't begrudge the secularists doing this to me. I don't begrudge this because, I, as I argued earlier, this is inescapable. You can't get away from it. All legal systems, all societies must protect the God of their system. And if it's a secularist society, it must protect the secularist God, and that secularist God is Demas. I'm not accustomed to quote him favorably, usually, but Vladimir Lenin uh, one time said there are two fundamental questions. Who, whom? Who is doing what to whom? Who, whom? He, uh, he understood the inescapability of certain questions. Now, I want to, um, I want to wrap up th um, my initial uh, comments by returning to uh, Servetus. I want you to, uh, I already quoted Lenin, let me quote you another Lenin, a prophet, one of your own. <laughs> Imagine there's no heaven. Dan, it's easy if you try. <laughs> Imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. Three feet above Servetus' head when he was being burned, what was there? Only sky. Three feet above John Calvin's head, what was there on your system? Only sky. Three feet above Buchenwald, what was there? Only sky. Three feet above every abortion clinic in America, what is there? Only sky. If we say that there is no God, there is no judgment, there is no eternal definition of justice, and all we have is what we, the people, say. The thing that has to be pointed out, and it has to be pointed out with some force, is that over the course of history, we, the people, have said and done some atrocious things. We, the people, would be better read as we, the sinners. We, the people. Do we really want to say that we, the people, can get together and have a vote and decide whether or not Jews or blacks are human beings. Have a vote and decide whether or not they are uh, w worthy of the full protection of the law. If there is nothing above the people, if there's nothing over Demas, but only sky, we're in trouble. All right, now we will hear Mr. Barker's rebuttal to Mr. Wilson's opening statement, and it will be for 10 minutes. Thank you, Doug. I think um, Doug showed very well our major disagreement here, besides Bible belief. I agree with you 100%, Doug, that it is inescapable for government to impose morality. That's what governments do. That's what governments should do. That's what we the people hope our government does, is protect people from harm. You did not define morality tonight, and you'll have a chance to later, I suppose. Maybe I'll ask you to. So let me define morality. A moral person is a person who intends to act in ways that minimize harm. That's what a moral person is. The minimizing of harm, real harm in the world, pain, violence, or whatever, is the goal of morality. Any, anyone who does not act with that intention, or anyone who attacks with the, acts with the intention to create more harm than is necessary, is by definition an immoral person. Governments 
uh, at minimum, are instituted to control society, we evolved in small groups, maybe 150 people or so. Huge governments are an, uh, a pretty much unnatural thing. They're an experiment for us to do. Running a government of almost 300 million people is quite an experiment. But the government, what it must do is protect the blessings of liberty, must protect our, our property, our bodies, our, our, our beings. And the, the word blessing means blessed by nature, not by God, by the way, because there is no God. Above us, there is only sky. Well, maybe a little bit of heat was above Servetus' head. So I agree with you, but our difference, Doug, is this. You are, you are making a fundamental mistake here, and, and it's surprising that you don't see this. Religion is not equal to morality. Morality and religion are separate things. Religion, in fact, is often equal to immorality. Now, let's take all the religions of the world that you can think of. Think of a bunch of them, all right? Uh, I was at a World Religions Conference two weeks ago in, uh, in Canada, and I sat at a table with a Hindu and a Sikh and a Muslim and a Jew and a Native American spiritualist and a bunch of others. And um, I was thinking, well, okay, this, was an, I, this is sort of an interfaith thing. And by the way, it was clear that atheism was not presented as a religion. Atheism was presented as a philosophy. And I made it very clear, atheism is not a religion. We have no God. I guess you could borrow the lowercase g. I guess in my case, my God would be jazz piano, you know, because I, I live for that. You know, I love jazz piano. And I get a real emotional experience when it happens to me. But um, I was wondering, what about all these religions? What do they have in common? Now, they all have things that make them different, right? Different rituals, different prayers, different beliefs, different habits, different numbers different holy books, different this, different that, different... Those things that make religions different from each other are what religion is, by definition. If you strip off all the things that make Calvinism different from Sikhism, the Sikhs claim that they have the one true religion. Their gurus have brought to the world the true religion. The Mormon church claims it's the only true religion, you know. But if you strip off all the things that make religions different from each other, right? All the things that you know, that can't be the same. What are we left with? We're left with some basic principle in most religions of peace and understanding and getting along and love, those kinds of things, right? We all think, well, these are the religious things that unite all religions in common, and isn't it nice that we can all be religious in some way? But you know what that is? What you're left with, if you strip off all the religious trappings, what you're left with is basic humanism. What unites us all is our humanity. What unites us as human beings is we breathe the same air. Above us is the same only sky. We feel pain, we hurt, we suffer, we raise our families, we mow the lawn, we change the diapers, we pay the rent, we get through our lives. That's what unites us. It's our humanism, the human values. And by nature, we are natural organisms in a natural environment. By nature, we recoil from harm. I don't have to rationally judge whether I should pull my hand from a fire. By nature, that's who we are as human animals. Uh, as Robert Wright called us, the rational animal. Uh, so by nature, we can assume that all of us have that basic same human nature, regardless of your differing religious beliefs, which you're free to have. This humanism is what unites us all, and that basic humanistic morality is the intention to act in ways that minimize harm. A government of us, the people, who share this in common, right, has a responsibility then to try to either help us or force us to act in ways that minimize real harm in the world. It makes no difference how many souls we try to put in heaven. What the difference makes is, do we have enough access to resources? Do we have enough access to housing and shelter? Are the poor going to be fed? Is inequality going to be eradicated? Is there going to be knowledge to be gained, things like that. Government has a responsibility in the real world with real human beings, the real human animals and the real human environment to try to minimize harm. Of course, you can't avoid all harm. Sometimes some harm is necessary. Sometimes some harm is even necessary to avoid harm. Like, like I think we would all agree that it's not a good idea to stick a needle into a baby, right? But if that baby needs a life-saving injection, we're going to do it. We realize that it's a smaller price to pay for a, a, greater, a greater harm, greater minimizing of harm. So you've got it totally wrong, Doug. Uh, you, 
your religious views are religious views. And you can run for public office in this country. You can run for whatever you want to. But when you swear on the Constitution of the United States to uphold that Constitution, you are required by that oath to set aside your religious beliefs, not your moral beliefs, not the beliefs that unite you and me in morality. You are obligated as a co-human being with me to act in humanistically moral ways. The only way to be truly moral in this world is through humanistic morality. What is it that affects us? What is our human nature? It doesn't matter if we have offended some sovereign. Morality is not advanced by, try, by worshiping some dictator, by saying, oh, you are great, I love you, and I will never disobey you. Morality is not advanced by any of that. Worshiping a god might make you feel okay, but it doesn't advance morality. So as a Christian in government, you should impose the morality of secular humanism. You should impose that on us because your intention would be to minimize harm in the world. I would hope you would do that. But you should not impose your religious hymns on us. You should not impose your biblical edicts on us, like homosexuals being stoned to death, for example, or uh, you know, some particularly religious morality. Uh, abortion is uh, not necessarily a religious issue. There are some atheists and agnostics who are anti-abortion and argue on moral grounds against abortion. They're not bringing their atheistic reasoning into it to argue against uh, abortion. They're, they're using what they claim is a, a sound humanistic uh, morality to do it. So uh, you are free to hold your views, but when you swear to take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States or the state of Idaho or whatever, you are obligated to put aside your religious views, those views of your religion that are distinct from other religions, and you are obligated to join me in truly making this a world with less violence, more understanding, more peace, and more love. All right, now we will hear Mr. Wilson's rebuttal. Most of this will be my response to uh, Dan's first presentation, but I'd like to begin with his uh, comment on a believer. If I were in a position where I were elected to public office, let's take a, an extreme example. If I were somehow, by some freak, some fluke, elected president of the United States, and what a glorious two weeks that would be. <laughs> <laughs> The first thing I would do when I swore to uphold the Constitution is I would do that. I would swear to uphold the Constitution, and I would do it with my left hand on a Bible, just like Bill Clinton did. <laughs> One of the early points that Dan made was that religion is divisive. Well, it certainly is. I would go a step further and say people are divisive. People are cranky. People fight over all, things, all sorts of things. People, religion is divisive, but so is politics. Politics is divisive. Do we outlaw politics because it's divisive? Religion creates gurus. Well, so does Oprah. <laughs> so does day daytime television. We don't, uh, of course, religion creates gurus. That's true. Um, but that's not a reason. That, there's no compelling reason why we should say, point to that and say that we should keep uh, religion out of the public square. The third thing that he said is, goes to the heart of what Dr. Stokes identified as, um, in my view, uh, one of the hidden premises, one of the hidden um, factors in this debate. In fact, I'll, I'll identify it as a hidden premise and bring it out, although some of you might think it's not so hidden. But there's an aspect of this that is a hidden premise. Um, Dan told us that religion creates conflict. Religion creates conflict. The thing that is interesting about this, and this is the hidden premise, he's assuming in this that conflict is bad. He's assuming that conflict is bad. The problem with you, Dan would say, the, the problem with you, Osama, Dan would say, is all this conflict. And Osama would just look at him and blink. <laughs> of course there's conflict. We're at war. We want to kill you all. You're infidels, and we're infidels to him as well as you, and he would um, be happy to kill us both. <laughs> and, and we can't say, but Osama, this is conflict. 
<laughs> he would say, I know. <laughs> I know it's conflict. And we are winning. <laughs> or we intend to win. When, when we say, look, separate, let's get along. Let's all get along. As, the, as though um, sort of the ethos of the Cosby show is a coherent worldview. <laughs> let's just... Let's just get, go along and get along and, and every, well, wait a minute. We have to a answer the question, why is conflict bad? Is it bad according to Darwin? Is it bad according to the overwhelming practice of the human race throughout all recorded history? One of the most obvious things about the human race, if you look at us dispassionately, if you, if you were a visiting Martian uh, deposited here and had access to the newspapers and the libraries and you looked at the history of the human race, one of the, one of the things you'd have to conclude is that human beings like to fight. They, why do we fight and kill each other? Well, because at some level we like to do it. Now, I'm a Christian minister and I don't believe we ought to like to do it. I do believe that we ought to um, pray for and labor for the coming of Christ's kingdom. I think we ought to labor for the time when the swords will be beaten into plowshares. I believe that we need to affirm that death is an enemy, and we must never forget that. But you have to remember that when you say that above us is only sky, this leads us, leaves us with some very sticky questions. If there is no judgment, if there is no God, if there is no afterlife, and all we are are um, mostly protoplasm, organized in a certain particular way, if all we are are complex chemical reactions functioning in a certain way, then what on earth could possibly be wrong with this collection of enzymes being in conflict with that collection of enzymes? There is no image of God here. There's no human dignity other than what we ourselves determine to bestow. And if we determine to bestow it, then we can take it away. As Job said of Yahweh in the Old Testament, the Lord gives the Lord takes away. That's a divine prerogative. If demos is God, then we can bestow human dignity on one another, and we can have a referendum, and if 51% want to take it away, 51% can take it away. We have to realize that Adolf Hitler came to power by means of democratic processes. You can't simply say that demos uh, is infallible or demos will do no wrong unless you're prepared to say by definition that when the Aztecs organized their society the way they did where they would routinely sacrifice human beings one after the other tearing the beating human heart out of out of their chests that their their practice and understanding of demos made that okay if you're willing to open wide and swallow the rel that relativistic assumption then please do so but then let's not have a debate like this and say something like conflict is bad. Because if there is no God, you have to give an account for why conflict is bad. It was said earlier that anyone uh, who thinks that Calvin was a good guy is morally bankrupt. But you say that like it's a bad thing to be morally bankrupt. Why is it bad to be morally bankrupt? What does it mean to be morally bankrupt? By what standard are you judging me to be morally bankrupt? What are you, what are you appealing to? Ultimately, since you are, you, um, your fundamental God, as far as I've been able to tell, is we the people, is that Calvinism is morally bankrupt in societies where the secularists have managed to eke out 51%. But Calvinists are not morally bankrupt in Calvinist societies, by definition. Unless you say that human societies are have to be governed by a United Nations sort of thing, which, is, which means that there's been no demos at all in the history of the world down to the formation of the United Nations in 1948 or wh whenever it was. So when you say that Cal whoever thinks that Calvin is admirable, that's moral bankruptcy, I want to know by what standard. And why should Dan Barker's standard of what constitutes moral, morally bankrupt, uh, moral bankruptcy be something that I care about? Why should Calvin care about it? Why should Servetus care about it? They're dead, right? They're dead. What difference does it make? Who cares? Now, I think we have to care, but I believe that we have to have a reason to care, right? If uh, uh, he who says A must say B, and if I believe that I am simply a chance concatenation of atoms, and that's all I am, 
And this debate between Dan Barker and myself is a debate between uh, a complex chemical reaction that's eighth, uh, you know, like a bottle of pop that you shake up and it's fizzing on the table over there. And I'm, he, you know, he's Dr. Pepper and I'm uh, Mountain Dew and you shake both bottles and you put it on the table and they're fizzing over. You wouldn't ask which one's winning the debate. You would say they're not debating, they're fizzing. <laughs> this one might be fizzing more, <laughs> but they're, they're not debating. It's just a chemical reaction. It's just a chemical reaction. Well, if that's all we are, complex atoms banging around, then what does it mean to debate? It, it's meaningless. What does it mean for one of the bottles of pop to say to the other bottle of pop, I don't like your system of morality, um, you Mountain Dew Calvinist? <laughs> what we're being told is that believers in office, when believers run for office, they are being charged with being schizophrenic. All right, you, can, you can be a Christian and be in the legislature. You can be a Christian and hold office. But you must keep your views about reality to yourself. You don't have the freedom to express it publicly. And I believe that that's an imposition of morality. Now, notice that Demos, the, uh, the advocate of Demos, wants to impose on me. If I run for, if, uh, and again, I'm not blaming him for doing this. I've argued that it's inescapable. If Dan Barker's running the show, and I am elected to office, he says, OK, you can think your Christian thoughts, but I don't want any of that nonsense uh, on the floor of the Senate. I don't want any of that. I don't want you talking like that, in God we trust, or um, things like that. I don't want you to contract treaties like we concluded the war for independence with Great Britain. The Treaty of Paris uh, began with the words, in the name of the holy and undivided trinity. None of that. Well, if he does that to me, I, I expect that because I would do something similar to him, because all laws impose morality. If I'm a Christian and I believe that uh, our, our legal system ought to reflect the morality I believe to be the true morality, well, of course, that's commonplace. That's, um, that ought not to be controversial. I expect Dan to stand up for what he believes, and I expect uh, Christians to stand up for what they believe. Okay, now Dan has 15 minutes to cross-examine Doug. Okay, so we heard about John Calvin um, burning a man to death who committed no crime, who violated no law in that city or in that area, who broke no scriptural law, who simply disagreed with John Calvin's authority. He was burned to death along with his book. So I want to ask you, was John Calvin a good man? John Calvin was a good man. Not a perfect man, not a sinless man, but he was a good man. Yes. Okay, well you heard it. A man who, whose vanity and ego is so offended because someone disagreed with him, publicly burns him at the stake. A truly good man like Michael Servetus, who did exactly what John Calvin himself did by dissenting from the church. Demos has the right to kill anybody he wants. Well, you, um, I'm not arguing for Demos as a god, by the way. You misconstrued my argument, but... The people of Europe had the right to kill Servetus if they wanted. So John but, Calvin, the murderer, no, was the, a good man, according to you. If the people you. of Europe, Lutherans, Roman Catholics, and... It was John Calvin's decision. His vanity was offended. His authority was questioned. He was the big boss in that town, and he did not like some pipsqueak coming along and challenging his authority in the Trinity, and he had him publicly killed, burned in front of people. Before proceed, That's a good man? Before I proceed with the answer, let me go on record as saying that I differ with the execution of Servetus. I don't, I don't believe it was a good, good, righteous, or godly thing to do. But I will point out as a historical matter that all across Europe, the execution of Servetus was a brief, shining, ecumenical mo moment, and Roman Catholics and Lutherans and Reformed people all threw their hats in the, in the air, which means that although I, as a Christian, with an appeal to the Bible, have a problem with the ex execution of Servetus, you, who believe that over Europe was only sky, have no problem whatever, because the Europeans wanted to kill Servetus, so let them. I defined morality quite clearly, and you missed it uh, earlier. Why I, def they, why I defined morality as the intention to act in ways that minimize harm. That's what morality is. Tell me what is your definition of morality? Um, the Word of God. Okay. 
you, you have defined morality in a particular way, and I have no idea why 16th century Europe has any obligation to listen to you. Well, we can judge them today based on humanistic morality. We can say that they were brutal, they were uncaring, they were religiously blind, we can say they were monsters, we can judge them as being immoral, bad people. John so, Calvin was an immoral and bad person. But let me continue my questions. So what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to them? They're all dead. We're okay. going to try to avoid those mistakes. We're going to try to keep John Calvin from running Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> We're going to try to keep you out of this. Okay, uh, earlier what I said when I was, I was desperately trying to blaspheme God. D did I succeed? Did I blaspheme God in my, in my comments, do you think? No, if, if, if Michael Servetus is the standard, you didn't come close. Okay, what would I have to say? <laughs> Michael Servetus' crime was questioning the Trinity. That was his only crime. He questioned the Trinity. Now, and what would I have to say to be a blasphemer? Give me an example. Uh, no, I'm not about to do that. Well, no. tell me what... <laughs> <laughs> you might do it. I like, I like you too much. What would I have to say, though? How do you know what blasphemy is, then? Is it offending God? What is it? Is it calling him names? What? Um, blasphemy, the, the Greek word for blasphemy, is synonymous with the word for slander. So rail, railing, vituperation, uh, screaming at God, uh, cursing him, that sort of thing, would constitute blasphemy. So if I say, God, you are a, a, an immoral bully, and if you created hell, you should go to hell. Is that blaspheming God? Uh, I would say the content of that is blasphemous, but no, I'd, I wouldn't describe you making that point for the purposes of illustration and argument constitutes blasphemy. But what if all. I really meant it and I said it to God directly then? Well, if you, if you really meant it, I think that what we need to do is get a bunch of human beings to declare that you're out of here and that's okay with you. But I'm trying to make a point here. I know. <laughs> So, so am I. This is a debate. Because your Bible, <laughs> your Bible mandates the death penalty for blasphemy. So how are we supposed to know what not to do if that's part of the uh, government that you and John Calvin think is an acceptable government? What is, you know, if I said that to God and really meant it, would that be blasphemy? Um, Yes. I, okay. If you're can, asking me if can the sin of blasphemy be committed today, the answer is yes. It, it can be committed. But the thing that's important to, to note here is that, um, and this is something that Christians are familiar with because we debate it and discuss it among ourselves a lot because we read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. One of the things we have to recognize is that there is a development of Revelation. God deals with Israel in particular ways that he does not deal with the Christian church today. There were certain stipulations and restrictions in Israel's legal code that had to do with that period in redemptive history. And so consequently, in this experiment, if I were, if I were king for a day and I could make any laws that I wanted, I would not take the laws of the Mosaic Code and simply plop them down on modern America. I think that that would do an injustice to the flow of progressive revelation from Genesis to Revelation. So. Is blasphemy, does, does the first table of the law in the Ten Commandments, does the first table, the, the commandments having to do with God, hallowing God's name and, and serving no other gods, does the first table of the law still apply today? Yes. Ought the first table of the law, um, should it represent criminal offenses? There's a distinction between a sin and a crime. That's a separate question. Well, in your writings, you say that blasphemy is a capital crime. I've but, read things that you've written that say that blasphemy is a capital crime. It deserves the death penalty. You still ag agree with that? Well, there's a... Or have you changed your mind? No, I've not, I've not changed my mind on this. Uh, blasphemy is a capital crime in Israel in the Mosaic Code. Right? In the Mosaic Code, there's no, when you do the exegesis, there's no question about the fact that blasphemer, a blasphemer in ancient Israel would be executed. So then those laws don't apply to us today anymore? Today. There, are a number of, there are a number of laws in the Mosaic Code that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ and they do not apply today or they do not apply in the same way. You mentioned, for example, the execution of homosexuals, which I'm glad you brought up because in Leviticus, um, you, that's one of the laws that not only was homosexuality a capital offense, so was adultery. There were a number of um, uh, things that were a capital offense in the Old Testament but then when Christ comes, and the famous case of the woman caught in adultery, which was a capital offense, 
She was brought before Jesus, and Jesus delivers a statement that I think has to do with the, uh, that teaches us the relationship of the old covenant and the new covenant. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, not to come, uh, come down and, and, and administer gun barrel justice. In the letter of Corinthians, Paul writes to the Corinthians who were a ragtag sexual bunch, and he lists a number of sins among them, being catamites, being sodomites, and he says to the Corinthians, such were some of you. But he doesn't require them to go jump off a bridge because this was a capital crime in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And so consequently, we do not believe that we should take the Mosaic Code and just drop it on modern society uh, as though the incarnation and death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ had not happened. I don't believe that. So then you don't think it's a good idea for Christians today to be pushing the Mosaic Code called the Ten Commandments in public places then? You would agree with me that they should be out of public spaces. Right. I, I agree with you that Christians ought not to be opposed to murder. <laughs> That's in the Ten Commandments. I know that. There are three of the Ten Commandments that are actually good uh, All right. Moral. We're making progress. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And those three precepts against killing, perjury, and stealing existed long before the Israelites told us that they claimed the copyrights to them. It wasn't as if we were so stupid we never would have figured out there's something wrong with killing. I mean, you, you define morality as God. How do you know that? I mean, how do you know that morality is God? How do you judge God to be good then if morality is God? God may as well not be good. You may, morality might be brutality then by your definition. God reveals himself as I am that I am. He is the self-existent, self how do you know that? defining one. How do you he, know that? He told us. How? He, he spoke to us, gave Where? us his word in the Bible. What? Well, how do you know that's God's word? Um, well, there are a number of reasons. Do you want, where do you want me to start? <laughs> well, uh, uh, it, was written by, it was written by human hands, right? You bet. You bet. And they said that God was inspiring them, right? Why do you believe them? Uh, the reason I believe them, uh, I'll just start at this. This is probably the simplest place to start. John, in, uh, in 1 John chapter 5, he says, I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Bible is given to us so that our estrangement from God, our alienation, our loneliness, our sinfulness, our rebellion, fundamentally our sin problem can be washed Away. But how do you know that's true? Because how do you know those words are true? Who told you they're true? My, Who told my, you you must believe what First John says? Where did my, that idea come from? Well, uh, there, there are two ways to answer this. I'll, I'll give you the simplest answer. I believe that the Bible is the word of God um, and am a, faith, uh, am a practicing Christian because I was brought up in a Christian home and my mother spanked me faithfully. I can see it in your eyes. Uh. <laughs> That's, what, that's why I believe. I, I, I was brought up by Christian parents who loved God and loved me and loved others. And Jesus says, by this you will know, uh, will all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. And I would say that's the, basic, um, that's the basic authentication of the Christian message to the watching world. We don't know how to love in our own in our own power and our own authority. We're a pack of sinners. We bite and devour and but, and fight. But you're not answering the question. How do you know any of that is true? You're just, you're just spouting what the Bible says, assuming that it's true, assuming that those theocrats who wrote it back then knew what they were talking about. How do you know they were not lying to you? How do you know that? You have a, you, your mother spanked you? <laughs> violence again? Religious violence is what... <laughs> yes. No. Not, not, only, not only was it religious violence perpetrated upon my person, it was religious violence that was highly justified and called for. Well, just I'm, I'm, turn, sure, I'm sure you agree with that. Well, just, um, just turn the other cheek, you know. <laughs> Which I did. Huh. <laughs> this is deteriorating. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you want to finish answering? This is something that um, I'll remind you from our, our previous debate in Delaware. I, don't, I do not believe it's the Christian's call to try to find some neutral zone or some neutral ground where, 
we and unbelievers can agree on the rules of logic or historical investigation and try to reason from that place to the Bible. I'm not interested in reasoning my way to the Bible. I'm a Christian. I want to reason from the Bible. The Bible's my starting point. The Bible's where I begin. Okay. That's an assum that was the basic assumption that we talked about earlier. He thinks the Bible is worth something because somebody told him or his mother spanked him or what. So I guess that raises the ultimate question. If you judge God to be good, how do you know that? If, if God is... How do you know that God is not an evil pain in the butt? How do you know that he's just not fooling you? How do you judge that he's good unless you have a standard of judgment that's above God? That's one of the reasons I rejected Christian morality is because I think there's a higher way. There's a better way. How do you know there's not a higher way of judging than simply saying God is morality? How do you know that? Is your mind closed to that possibility? No, it's, it's, it's simply a, this is simply a, uh, a problem that, that we would address by definition. If there were a standard higher than God, then that standard would be God and not no, God. No, it wouldn't. A standard is not a God, but go ahead. Well, if, if, if there were a standard binding on this God that he ought to be obeying, this standard, this personal God that ought to be obeying this higher standard would have to be, just like the rest of us, obeying it or not for a reason. And standards, um, laws, morality, are the word of a God, the word of an authority fundamentally. Uh, and this is not something we differ on, because you believe that our laws are the voice of Demos. I believe that our laws ought to be the voice of the triune God of Scripture. We agree on that, that the laws are the voice of the God of the system. And if you have a higher voice over God, then the God who spoke, spoke that higher word would, would be God, by definition. We still have a few seconds? or uh, yeah. uh, Well, then... So then you're okay with somebody from another religion saying that their God is morality. Um, you're okay with Muslims saying that Allah is the ultimate star, or with uh, some other religious person simply declaring that they have a premise that their mother spanked into them. That, that you're okay with them saying that, and they can be right then. Well, no, I don't think that they're right, but I believe that what their position is at least coherent. They know what they believe. They know why they believe it. If Allah is God, follow him. If Jehovah is God, follow him. If Demos is God, follow them. All right, now Doug will have the opportunity to cross-examine Dan. Okay, this is uh, something that's come up a number of times. Uh, you defined morality for us according to your system. Uh, you said that morality acts in ways that minimize, the, uh, is, is to act in a way that will minimize harm. Why? Well, to clarify it, uh, a person can be called morality, can be called moral, who intends to act in ways that minimize harm okay. in the world, okay? You're allowing for accidents and that's Yeah, because you might try and fail, or in fact, you might not try and succeed, and you, can, you know, you can't be accidentally moral, but, um, and you might try your best and not have enough information and make the wrong decision, but as long as your intention is to act in ways that minimize harm, minimize harm by definition, you are called moral or ethical. And um, this, is, um, this is what morality means. When you're talking about morality, you're talking about how do we get along? How do we avoid harm? How do we avoid violence? How do we successfully navigate through this world that we bump into th other things and other people as physical organisms? Because that's what we are. We are a mass of atoms fizzing, basically but an amazing organization of that mass of atoms that is fizzing with no heaven above us. Who, who it's incredible. Them? But I'm answering your question about morality first. Um, morality basically means acting in ways that do not cause harm. And so why? why? That's what I'm asking you. Because why? by nature, physical organisms naturally recoil from harm. I already spelled that out. No, if I recoil from harm being done to me, but that's not morality. That's called a nervous system. Yeah, but still... I know that's not morality, but, but you know that if you stick my hand in the fire, that my hand is, I'm probably going to feel the same pain you do. You know that I'm, a, you, I'm also a sentient physical organism in the same environment you're in. So uh, if I want to call myself a moral person, and there is no such thing as morality with a capital M. There is no cosmic thing called morality. It's a, it's a label that we use. And a, a lot of religious people make this mistake of reifying words. They think, oh, morality. How do we find morality? As if it were some big mystery. And a lot of churches have a lot of investment in keeping morality this big 
mystery because then we need a code of commandments or some rules or how do we how do we do that you know and but come why? to my church and 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 then i'll tell you how to do that morality is not complicated it's simply acting in a way that tries to result in the least amount of harm in the world you have to define what harm is obviously and then uh, you also have to use reason to evaluate the the various consequences, the relative merits of the various consequences of your actions, and say, well, as far as I know, this action will result in this, in this one. So I'm going to have to. You're going to have to do a calculation. Right. The brain is a calculating machine. You're going to have to calculate, and based on what I know, I'm going to make this decision that results in the end with less harm in the world. That's what morality means. Morality doesn't mean flattering the ego of some sovereign God who wants to be worshipped and praised and told how good he is. How does that help morality? So morality doesn't, doesn't boil down to telling somebody how good he is. So if someone, if, if there were a system, a religious system in the world that repudiated the minimization of harm or perversely uh, adopted as the, one of their tenets of worship the maximization of harm to others, that would be immoral. Yes, because okay. of our common shared human According, nature. Why should they listen to you? Well, uh, if they don't, we have systems of law and self-defense. We have you'll ways harm, of protecting ourselves from people that are mentally unhealthy who would try to act in that way. You, you, so be you'll harm them. You'll impose on them. Well, I, I, will, I will only harm them as minimally necessary. I will not... <laughs> do you understand that? I will not impose the death penalty on someone just because God's will is offended. I will only say, in order to stop you from harming my family, I'm going to have to try to do what's minimally necessary, not out of vengeance or anger or out of whatever. I'm going to try to stop that harm from happening. That's why we have laws. That's why we have a government now, now to I try to enforce that morality. Now, I understand uh, a quarrel. You know, two animals can, could fight, two dogs could fight over a piece of meat. But y it would be strange to have the dog stop and say, one say to the other, you ought to have let me have it because I was here first. The fight is simple to understand. It's simply, I want it, I'm going to protect myself, I'm going to do whatever is necessary to protect my own turf or food or whatever. But the morality is an appeal to this, a standard that's over the both. And when one person appeals to a moral standard, they're appealing to a standard that the other person the, or the other group or the other entity has an obligation to recognize as authoritative. If you simply say... They don't have an obligation. They don't have any obligation. No. So how is it moral? Those of us who consider ourselves to be mentally healthy and moral have an obligation to minimize harm. That person has no obligation. There's no ought over that person. Why, why do you get to decide what's mentally healthy? Well, why don't they get to decide it? Well, if they decide in ways that result in the maximization of harm in the world, you're, you're then those of us who are mentally healthy will say that was wrong and we'll protect ourselves from nutcases like that. You're, you're we'll try to put them in jail. You know, that's what laws are for. You're, you're assuming what you need to prove. Why are you the mentally healthy one? Because, because we, we define, what? by definition, people who act in ways that are more peaceable and less violent, that allow for more of a freedom of survival of our organism by definition we call that good because it's positive to the organism yeah. you don't have to decide it i don't have to decree it i mean you and i both know that as human beings there are certain things that harm us and we don't decree that that should harm why, us why we just know you draw the circle at the human race why is it inherently immoral for someone else to have an ethical system that draws the circle a little smaller at the aryan race for example well i will judge whether or not their actions are resulting in more or less harm in the world. And if they are off well, why don't in some they get way... To, no, why do you get to judge them? Why don't they get to judge I you? Because I do. We do. As human beings, we do judge. That's right. what we do. All right? That's, that's the, part of our survival in the world. We are, we are the, the moral of, animal. That's part of the image of God in you. You judge. Well, uh, you, know what, you know what is right and wrong. And you don't judgment have is not a judgment is a mental calculation, a value calculation in a functioning brain. It does not transcend the mind. Uh, does a, is a computer a god because it does calculations? Our brains are computers. They compute. They make value computations. That doesn't why, mean it's a god. Why, why should, but you've just told me, why should I listen to you any more than I listen to a computer? You don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to listen to me. <laughs> well, I'm not. <laughs> well, good. But if you act in a way that threatens me, right, whether you're mentally healthy or not, or whether you're a Hitler or a, or a John Calvin, if you act in ways that threaten me and those that I love and those that I value, then I will do something to prevent that harm. I will act in a way that tries to minimize your harm. But that's just a fight. 
That's not an appeal to morality. Two animals can fight over a piece of meat. That's just a fight. Right? One threatens, one encroaches on the other's turf, one wants to take the other's food, someone wants to threaten the cubs or whatever. That's just a fight. An appeal to morality is you ought not to behave that way. And well, the other dog says, why not? Well, because that's I'll put you question. in jail, that's why not. Or <laughs> well, see, I'll restrict some a, of your freedoms. But that's not morality at all. That's, that's simply coercion. And at the end of the day, if there is nothing over us but sky, at the end of the day, that's all you have is raw power. Well, there's nothing wrong with power when it is uh, exercised in order to minimize harm. Sometimes we have to do that. Power can be good. And what's wrong with raw power? I mean, power is, you know, if you're trying to cause harm, if you're trying to inflict violence, then by definition you are an immoral, unethical, dangerous what, person. What do, you, what do you mean by definition? Is this by definition, by human beings. We have social conventions and we have words that we agree what they mean. You, you don't even have a definition for the word morality. You just say God. You don't even attempt to define the word. At okay, least I'll we humanists... Ex Exodus 20. At least we humanists have thought it through. <laughs> here's, the pr here's the difficulty. When you say, you, you're just assuming, this is another one of Dr. Stokes' hidden assumptions, you're assuming that the limits of the shared experience are the human race. Why don't we go broader and take it out into the animal kingdom, or why don't we go narrower and narrow it to the self-interest of a particular nation, Aryan race, or a tribe, or a particular entity? Um, the Aztec, were the Aztecs immoral for sacrificing humans the way they did? Yes, because their actions did not intend to result in minimizing harm. They were causing more harm than was necessary. You and I can declare that they were acting immorally. They may not have thought that. Their mindset might have been totally so that one, one Aztec priest at the top of the ziggurat is talking to another one, and the line of slaves is going down over the, you know, around the street corner, and they're going to kill them all today. And one of the priests says to the other, you know, Barker might not like this. Well, that's the tragedy of history. We're trying to rise above that. We're trying to rise above religion. We're trying to rise above the smallness no, of that why, kind of thinking. Why? Because we value... So you. Don't we, you no, value they, your life? No, they don't. Well, why okay, should they? Okay, well... Tell them, why, tell them why. Preach the good news to them. Why should they pay any attention? Why should they value hum, human life? All they are is a chance collection of atoms. These slaves going down there are nothing but meat and bones. That's all they are. And above them, only sky. So why should these Aztec priests who are going to kill these people care what you or I think? Well, if I were alive back then, and if I had some way to try to stop them from doing that, I would consider myself an immoral person not to try. But okay. since we can't go back in time, we can at least do what we can today. We can try to avoid those mistakes that were made. In them. We can try to improve. We can try to progress as a species. Uh, we're, we're not dogs fighting over meat. We are a lot of people call the moral animal. We have a much greater cranium. We have much greater computational power, and we can use moral reasoning, although a lot of our moral judgments are just moral feelings. We evolved a lot of feelings. We instinctively know because of, the, because of our evolutionary past. What, I, 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 mean, respect the, I respect right? the fact that you would try to intervene and try to do something about it, and I honestly believe you. I believe that you would, and I would also point out that you still have more than a little bit of residual Christianity about you. You haven't shaken it all loose yet. Oh, because I'm a nice guy, right? Yeah. Oh, so only Christians can be nice guys. <laughs> no, no, I didn't, I didn't say right. that. What it, but what I'm saying is that you have, um, when you say uh, um, it, a consistent relativist would walk into that situation and say, who are we to impose our Western values on these indigenous people? Who are we to do that? A consistent relativist would do that. But you're not yet consistent. You're not there yet. But if their actions were not involving harm in any way, I'm not going to interfere. I don't care what prayers they want to pray. I don't care what rituals they want to do. But if their religious practices or, or legal or social or moral practices are resulting in unnecessary harm that could be stopped, Can an then we as human beings, we relate to that. I mean, if you're mentally healthy, don't you empathize with pain? Does, don't you feel it when someone else is hurting? If you don't, there's something a little bit off about you. you know? can, an un, can an unborn child feel pain and experience harm? Some, uh, um, you mean an unborn fetus. Uh, it, at some levels, there is some pain, but it, it may not be cognitive pain. But yeah, there's some. 
And okay, abortion they, is not necessarily an, an atheistic issue. I, I am firmly pro-choice. I firmly support a woman's right to choose. It's none of my business what she does. The fetus is not a human being. Killing a fetus is not murder. But there are questions of where the line is drawn, and I agree those are important social questions to be asked. And if you want to make a moral argument, not a religious argument, but a moral argument regarding abortion, then let's talk about it. But if you just want to say God told you, then uh, we're not talking the same language. Let's okay. talk true morality and not just religious edicts. So um, can a child already born experience pain and harm? Well, of course. Three, so. Three-day-old infant. So a day after they can experience harm, a day before they can't? Um, where, uh, where's, where would you draw the line? A third trimester fetus can feel some pain, right? Okay, well, um, I guess I'm asking, your, your, your whole system of morality is based upon do no harm to no, others. No, it's not. That's not right. exactly, not all. My system of morality is based on minimizing harm, not right. do no harm. Okay. Because there's not just a baby involved, there's a woman involved, there's a family involved, there's a society involved. And so true morality says, look, balancing all of these things, balancing all the possible outcomes, uh, there's no doubt uh, at all that uh, even a first trimester abortion causes some harm to tissue, right? I mean, right. there's harm that's caused. Right. But true morality means balancing and weighing and finding out which is the course that causes the least amount of harm in the world, even though some harm may have to be caused. And when it comes to a woman who is pregnant with an unwanted fetus, it is none of my business to decide for her how to make that computation. When it comes to a born child who's in this world, who has a social security number and a birth certificate, society takes over. But when the woman is pregnant, when the woman is pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy, that is her choice to make, and I might even disagree with her moral choice, but it is her choice to make in a free country. That social security number is more p important than I thought, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> the one, one, last one last question. Do you believe that if society made the determination that the age up to which you could terminate the life of a child was the first birthday after the child was born, and it had to be done in accordance with your system of minimizing harm, everything taken into account, let's say a severely disabled baby or some, something like that, you want to minimize harm, would it be consistent with your system of morality to minimize harm in the society by taking the life of a six-month-old child? I sincerely doubt that there would remotely be any possible scenario where that situation But in principle, could it could happen. Well, yes. If, if you found some ways... Uh, here's, a, here's an absurd example. Can I finish this question, or should we stop here? No, you can finish. Uh, here's an absurd example, okay? And I admit it's absurd. But suppose, suppose some advanced aliens came to this planet. And you know how cats like to play with mice? for who knows why, before they, they, they'd like to play with them and torture them before they, uh, part of God's great intelligent design. Um, um, suppose these aliens said, well, we want to play with the human species, and we're going to kill you, we're going to play with you all, and, and we think they're perverted because their morality doesn't respect our life. But suppose they said, Doug, you could save the human species by torturing one innocent child. You could save all six billion human beings if you would just let us see you torture one innocent child. Um, that's a tough question to ask. I don't know how I would answer that, but it's a question worth asking. Would I do that, or else we're all going to die, right? Would you do that? Uh, I suppose some people might reason that in that e extreme case, the moral principles and the balance of harm might outweigh. But in our daily lives, we don't live like that. We don't live with emergency, extreme situations. In our daily lives, uh, we live with, with basic humanistic kindness and, and compassion. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was a debate with Dan Barker and Douglas Wilson on whether religion and government should be strictly separate. Get the rest of the debate at canonpress.com.